I like that statement. There's a place for you here. Amen? How many of you feel like you're growing in faith as we've gone on this journey through Genesis? Few people. Most of you not. I haven't taught you a thing at all. All right. We're just going to wrap it up. No. You know, I think one of the things I love about the Old Testament, especially when I was a new Christian, we were all told that the Bible is made up of books that are just put together. They're man-made. They're made for rules, and you can't obtain the rules, and nobody knows this, and it's just a bunch of garbage, right? Hopefully you've seen through this journey so far in Genesis is that the Bible is made up of imperfect people like you and I. If I was going to write a, a book that I wanted to begin my own little cult and the world follow it, it would not look like this book. It just wouldn't, right? I mean, everybody would be perfect. Everybody would be getting along. Nobody would be making mistakes. And the list goes on and on and on. Amen? But when you look at this book, what, what, what sensed it in for me, what solidified the faith for me was when I was reading this, and, and, and please understand when I say this, I, I looked at him like, these people are really messed up. They look like me. Tracking with me? Like these people got some serious problems. Just like me. They keep turning their back on God, just like me. They, they keep sinning, just like me. They, they keep stumbling and making bad choices, like me. If I was writing a book, the Book of Mormonites, it wouldn't look like this. Who wants to follow these people? Nobody wants to follow me. Nobody wants to follow you. What really solidified is I seen their mess ups. And they reminded me of my own. And if they could get through it, if God still loved them through it, I could get through it and God would still love me through it. And when I read this, I find these people to where literally they get right with God, they find deliverance from their problems and their ever current situations. And if they can find deliverance and healing and holiness and, and sanctification, so can I, because when I look at it, I'm, I'm a mess, but boy, they're a lot worse than I am. Right? Maybe. <laughs> you ever do that? Remember I said we could see ourselves in the pages of the Bible from page one to the last page, if you, if you look at it, and, and too many times we're, we're told that God is angry and, and God is not just and, and God doesn't care. And I look at this going, my gosh, he, he is so forgiving. He is so gracious with us. He redeems us and he delivers us no matter how bad it is, no matter how much we've messed up. Heals us. He delivers us. At any age, any problem, any, anything that you can imagine, I, I'm watching it unfold, not only in the pages of the Bible, I'm, I'm watching it unfold in my life. I don't know how people can't see this and, and yet not throw themselves at God, realizing that we are a mess without him, and this Bible keeps telling us how to get unmessed. I, I know you English teachers... And, Pastor Wes is going to reprimand me after this. That's Midwesterner, right? He's going to unmess me if that's possible. My wife's been trying a long time. She hasn't done it. it there literally has to be a God in heaven to do it, right? It sounds legit. But if you really, really, really dove in the Bible and seen your reflection, or is Christianity still this entertainment of let me study it, let me find out who wrote it, what was going on? And we do this Christian entertainment sort of, and all those things are important. Don't get me wrong. We need to know who wrote it and why they wrote it and who were they writing to and their purpose. Those are important. But if you just stop there, you messed it up. 
if you just stop with the knowledge and it never gets from your head to your heart, you've done yourself a disservice. You've done Jesus Christ a disservice in his sacrifice for you. Amen. So let me get to preaching. So I want to talk about a, a really wonderful topic that most of us have known. Some of us are in the middle of, some of us are having a great one, some people are messing up, whatever. We're going to talk about marriage, right? I would say about 90% of the people in here are married or have been married, amen? amen. If you are single today, I'm not pointing you out, but if you're single, raise your hand. Widow, widower, whatever, you know, raise your hand. Some of y'all lie and I'll see you at the altar later, right? Do you think the Bible can still teach us something about marriage? I, I know not Terry and Ruth. I know that. They got it. They need it. Perfect people in the back, right? But do you think the Bible can still help us out in our marriage? Do you think, you know, during the rough spots of our relationships that God is still involved? I will tell you now, there's a systematic connection between your marriage and how it works and your relationship with God and how it works. If your marriage is junk, I can almost guarantee your relationship with God is junk. In your marriage, if you're not loving, gracious, forgiving, and gentle, I really doubt you are to God in heaven that you have not seen. If you blame your spouse for everything, I'm sure you also blame God for everything as well. There is a direct correlation between your marriage and your relationship with God, and you'll be like, Brad, you're way off base. No, I don't think so. My opinion, but I think it's right. Hey, you can meet me in Genesis, surprisingly, uh, chapter 29, and we're going to go into uh, chapter 30 as well. Last week, we, we learned that Jacob married two ladies. Whew. You just see the disaster coming ahead of time, don't you? Every man says amen. And he married two sisters, which is worse. You talk about sadistic? If I was writing a cold book, I would not do this. Just so you know, right? But Jacob marries two sisters. He really wanted the one, but he got two. And remember, Leah, her eyes didn't go the same direction. And she didn't have a lovely build and yada, yada, yada. And Rachel was all beautiful. And he ends up with both, yin and yang. But there's an issue that will further go on. Here's what the NIV reads. When the Lord saw that Leah was not loved. Again, if I was writing a call... He enabled her to conceive, but Rachel remained childless. Leah became pregnant and gave birth to a son, Reuben, for she said, it is because the Lord has seen my misery. Something Pastor Stephen was talking about a minute ago, right? Surely my husband will love me now. Can we stop there? There was a show on TV called MTV it was a young teenage girl's pregnancy. What was it called? Thank you for being a congregation that doesn't know. <laughs> but I guarantee somebody does. Teen mom. Does that read like teen mom? Oh, now that I have a baby, I'll be loved. Is that a real thing in our world today? Sure is. I can tell you now there's a lot of teenage girls who just want to feel loved and they feel unloved. And I think the only way they can is with a baby. It's nothing new. It's been since the beginning. And now she feels like her husband and people are going to love her because she's got a baby. Surely my husband will love me now. She conceived again. And when she gave birth to a son, she said, because the Lord heard that I am not loved he gave me this one too. So she named him Simeon. Again, she conceived, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, now, at last my husband will become attached to me. Teen mom still, right? Because I bore him three sons. So she named him Levi. She conceived again, and when she gave birth to a son, she said, this time I will praise the Lord. So they named him Judah. Then she stopped having children. 
When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she became jealous of her sister. Any of y'all ever got jealous over your sister? No? Okay. All right. Different congregation. Y'all the pretty ones in the family. Right? So she said to Jacob, give me children or I die. I don't know what she meant. Was Jacob supposed to go out and kidnap children? Right? Sometimes you wives, you make it so demanding on us men. Right? Give me children or I die. Jacob became angry with her and said, am I in the place of God who has kept you from having children? Sounds like now we're getting into a firm discussion, a.k.a. an argument. Right? Then she said, here is Billah, my servant. Sleep with her. She did. Sleep with her so she can bear children for me, and I too can build family through her. Do y'all remember this girl named Hagar and Isaac about 10 chapters back? Just making sure we remember this family tree line. So she gave her servant Billah as a wife. Jacob slept with her like a fool. And she became pregnant and bore him a son. Then Rachel said, God has vindicated me. He has listened to my plea and given me a son. Because of this, she named him Dan. Dan? <laughs> Not say anything. <laughs> Rachel's servant, Bella, conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel says, I've had a great struggle with my sister. And I've won. I don't know if you're keeping score, but it's four to two. She's not winning. Apparently they didn't teach math back then. But let's keep going. So she named them Natalia. When Leah saw that she had stopped having children, she took her servant Zilpah and gave her Jacob as a wife. Leah's servant Zilpah bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, what good fortune. So she named him Gad. Leah's servant Zippo bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, how happy am I? The woman will call me happy. So she named him Asher. During the wheat harvest, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, real quick, a mandrake is a plant. This plant um, is like a big ginger root, kind of almost has an arm and a leg. Mandrakes were used. Um, they're very uh, fruitful smelling. Some of y'all didn't like Susan and I bringing in our uh, guavas from our house. Smelled really good. Mandrakes smell good. But mandrake was also used to help in reproductive systems. So she wanted some. She said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrake too? Very well, Rachel said. He can sleep with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. We are negotiating sex for a root, just so you know. Again, if I was reading right in a cult book, this is not the way to do it. So Jacob came home from the fields that evening. Leah went out to meet him. You must sleep with me, she said. I have hired you with my son's mandrakes. Said no wife ever since then. So he slept with her that night. God listened to Leah and she became pregnant and bore Jacob a fifth son. Then Leah said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband. So she named Ishkar. Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. Then Leah said, God has presented me with a precious gift. This time my husband will treat me with honor because I bore him six sons. She named him Zebulun, and sometime later she gave birth to a daughter named Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and enabled her to conceive. She became pregnant, and gave birth to a son, and said, God has taken away my disgrace. She named him Jacob and said, may the Lord add to me another son. 
what I say. It's a lot of children, a lot of people. It's Joseph. Joseph, do you know who Joseph's going to be? Do you see maybe ahead of time why there might be some fighting with the brothers? I mean, if you were to draw a family tree, it would look like a plate of spaghetti at this point in time, wouldn't it? It's bad enough to get along with your siblings, let alone half-siblings, people negotiating intimacy with roots and all this weirdness, and you take that maid, you take that maid, and wow, what a mess. It's almost guaranteed that Joseph and his brothers were not going to get along. Amen? And so when we look at this, I, I, I really want to say, among human beings, love specifically, that is hard. Marriage, I dare say, is impossible. That's why we need God in the middle of our marriage. Amen? When you look at this, you can see many of the mistakes people make. And sometimes bad examples are great examples to learn from. Amen? Listen, the, the Bible is insightful and there, there's so much to glean from and run out of time. So I just want to tell you three quick things that we can learn from this, right? The first thing is this. Marriage is defined by God in the Bible. It is defined by God. It is defined by Jesus. It is defined by James. It's defined by Peter. It's defined by John. And the list goes on and on and on and on. The Bible is the authority of messy, or of marriage. Not you. Not your government. Not your opinion. Not your mama. Not your daddy. The Bible. What does the Bible say? It's found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. Jesus himself, God in the flesh, says this. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. It doesn't say for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united with two wives. Right? As a matter of fact, the Bible later on condemns um, multiple marriages and relationships. The biblical definition of a marriage is one man, one woman. Not two men, not two women. Not two women, one man. Not two men, one woman. No point in time or are there to be farm animals involved in this or corpses or relatives or on and on and on and on. The Bible is very clear. We are so full of ourselves. Just read Psalms 119. We are so full of ourselves. We keep trying to redefine marriage. Jesus says one man, one woman. I understand people have urges. That is still not okay. This is what sin has done to our world. Tracking with me. Am I still your pastor? <laughs> For this week. Listen, the other thing is, where do you go when you're having a marital problem? I mean, if you look at it, Rachel is like, give me a child or I die. The, the two sisters are constantly making threats and negotiations and this and that. But I wonder who they were talking to. When you're having marital problems, where do you go? <laughs> Mandrakes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe in Pastor Robles. Not here. <laughs> right? I think about it. How many of y'all get in an argument with your spouse? The first thing you need to do is you're going to call your negative friend who can't keep a relationship for nothing. Boy, that happens all the time, doesn't it? And you get this great godly advice. Just leave him. I kick her to the curb. Da -da 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 -da. You show him. You show her. Why is it we always seek out bad advice? Easy, because we don't want someone to tell us the truth. We don't want someone to tell me, you need to forgive them, you need to love them, you need to work it out, you need this, you need to do that. Have you spent any time in prayer? Have you read the Bible? Have you sought the Holy Spirit? No, we'd rather go to a bar or some other place and whine and cry that our marriage is in trouble, but we don't realize and we're the ones sabotaging it by continuously making bad choices, right? If your marriage is in trouble, the first place I'm gonna tell you to go to is your knees, amen? Get on your knees and pray. 
Let me tell you the second thing you do is you go to the Bible. And you can see the messes, right? You can see the problems, right? And you go forward, right? The last thing you want to do is your marriage is in trouble is continue to make it worse by throwing fits, having temper tantrums, going crazy, smashing stuff and thinking, lashing out like a child is going to fix your marriage. You're doing permanent damage that you can't unfix. Tracking with me. The other thing is don't go and get advice from people or have people constantly keep picking scabs in your relationship right? Here's the problem. After all, you keep making bad choices. You're going to continue to have what you call PTSD. Everything looks the same. Everything looks bad. Or when you make a mistake, you project that mistake on your spouse, right? First thing we need to do, if your marriage is in trouble, get on your knees. Probably the second thing, first thing you should probably do is do this, right? Get on your knees. Seek God. I don't think Jesus Christ died on the cross so we continue to have fights and arguments and hurt each other, do we? No. The third thing is this. If your marriage is in trouble, learn to practice forgiveness. No matter what. Jesus says this in Matthew 6.15. If you do not forgive others of their sins, your father will not forgive you of yours. You ever seen somebody so mad in their relationship it'll end them up in the pit of hell? That's what's happening in a lot of marriages. I'm going to bring up everything you've done for the last 30 years. Right? I'm not talking about anybody in here. Right? But too many times people want to take and bring up every little offense, every little problem. When that happens, you have a spiritual problem. You do. If you're not willing to let go and to forgive, realize your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Do not let someone trap you all the way to the pit of hell. Our entire faith is built on forgiveness. Your marriage should be built on forgiveness. That doesn't mean somebody can do this and do that and you let them get away with it. No, that's not true because one, somebody's abusing your marriage. But if you have a marital problems, you need to forgive. You have to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't mean what that other person did was okay. What it means is you will no longer be a slave to what that other person did. Amen? Listen, the Bible also says, and Jesus clearly says this, those who forgive much have been forgiven much. So when you're struggling to forgive your spouse, think of every rotten thing you've done. Make a list and see how long you can hold on to your own unforgiveness. Amen? It's the interesting thing that many times in relationships and marriage, we want to point out, you did this and you did that and you did this, and all we do is stand there and point fingers. I learned a long time ago, when your finger is going out this way, you got three coming right back at you. Amen? Do you think you have a happy marriage by pointing out each other's mistakes? No. No. How would it feel if God did that? Oh, I remember when you were 16, Stephanie. Right? Dan. I'm going to have fun with Dan for now. (laughs) Right, Dan, you did something when you're 23. I know you don't remember, but you did something wrong, and I'm going to point that out. It's really joking, but don't we do that a lot in relationships? We struggle to forgive each other. We struggle to forgive our kids. We struggle to forgive our friends. We struggle to forgive those who've trespassed against us, right? And the Bible tells us we must. We must learn forgiveness. Now I can imagine in the life of Jacob and Rachel and Leah, there was hourly forgiveness. But I can tell you, maybe in the midst of the mess, a Joseph will show up in your life. Maybe in your family tree, the one who will change the world will come along. And while Jesus has already come and gone, ascended into heaven, you never know what the next generation under you will produce. Maybe the next Nobel Peace Prize winner. Maybe a president. Maybe a pastor. Maybe a bus driver. They're all honorable. 
don't forsake your lineage by fighting over dumb stuff you can't fix. You can't fix yesterday. You just can't. But you can at today's and tomorrow's. But as long as you sabotage the today's and the tomorrow's from the yesterday's, you will always fail non-stop. Amen? Sometimes forgiveness takes a little bit, doesn't it? I got a little hoo hoo right? Sometimes you need a cool down period. Sometimes you need to go for a walk, a bike ride, trip around the moon. I don't know what you need. Just get there. Motorcycle therapy. Amen. I'm going to ask Stephen and Jeanette to come up. Listen, I, it's sad to see Stephen and Jeanette go, but as I told them, when God calls you to stand in this place, he's calling you to something. We as a church, this church has a rich heritage of sending pastors from this church around the world, don't we? Missionaries, look around our district. Our district has almost half the pastors on this district started in this church. We have missionaries around the world. We, we have pastors out of state, in state, different states, state of mind, crazy state, I don't know. But church, you've done a great job. You believe in us as pastors. You support us and where we go. Amen? The one thing that I've always taught the staff is you never know what God has for you tomorrow. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. I always thought I would be a, a youth pastor. Hanging out with teens is a lot easier than you adults, just so you know. <laughs> but I remember the day where I had to make that decision. It's hard. It's painful. But God will continue to move you and stretch you and grow you. Our job as this church is to love those God sends us. Amen? Not only just those in the pews, but those on the platform. So over the next little month and a half, let's do everything we can to love on Steve and Jeanette and the girls. Amen? If they need help moving or a sandwich, whatever it takes. Basically, we're sending missionaries to Paso Robles. That's the way to look at it. They're going to take everything they learned here and do it up there. Just the good stuff, though. Right? Let me pray. Father God, we love you. We thank you. Lord, be with us this morning. Help us. Lord, if we're struggling somewhere spiritually, we're just lashing out like children. Lord, would you do a work within us? Help us today to see the goodness, to start anew. In Jesus' name, amen.